Hey guys, Stockaholics, thank you guys for being here today. Okay, so I wanted to talk a little bit more about A2 Milk Company and probably f the for the last time, for at least for a little while, <laughs> before I go dark on this one for a few months. So I feel like I've covered this topic quite extensively. And to be honest, I'm tired of talking about milk and I have so many other things that I wanted to talk about and make some videos on. Now this one has fixated me for the past month or so, which is okay. Uh, but there's a few last things I wanted to talk about on this one and some of the things I've noticed, right? Okay, first of all, I wanted to mention that companies that are in clear downtrends are risky. <laughs> any company in any kind of trend is risky. Uh, I've read some things on in various places where people are mentioning things like, well, at these current price levels, there's there's no risk. The uh, the the company can't we you can't lose, guys. There's there's always risk in investing in uh, equities, right? It's <laughs> the price is irrelevant of that. Just because the price is at a certain level doesn't mean it can't go lower, right? And uh, I think I might be guilty about maybe overhyping this company <laughs> but my goal is to share how I see this company now uh, your goal should be to uh, research the company yourself and see if what I'm saying aligns with uh, what other people are saying and what you think too right uh, to, to kind of think of, of what I'm what I'm saying matches your ex expectations about reality right now I've read some stories recently about some people in various places where they've lost thousands and thousands of thousands and thousands of dollars on this uh, this investment. And uh, man, I feel for you, but you know, uh, for me, I'm never going to uh, overextend myself into any position where I, if I lose money on that position, I'm going to really feel it. Uh, and I don't know different people's situations. Maybe that's a lot of money to them. Maybe it's not. Uh, but for me, that's a lot of money. <laughs> that's not an acceptable outcome for me, right? The only situation where that would be acceptable to me is if uh, one of my, not because I lost one uh, money on one position, but because I lost money in an overall broad uh, stock market sell-off, right? Uh, now. I also have a plan for that too, right? I also have a cash position to take advantage of those situations, right? So if there's a stock market panic or a sell-off, I have money to survive for several months. And on top of that, I have a cash allocation that can take advantage of those kinds of situations too. By the way, I've thought, I've thought a lot about that. So if you're interested in a video on that, let me know too. Okay, so to put into context how much I have committed to this position relative to my entire investment portfolio, for portfolio English, I have about 2% of my overall portfolio currently invested into A2, right? Now, like I mentioned, my plan from the beginning was to scale into this position. I noticed it was in a downtrend. I wasn't trying to time a bottom. So for me, the way that uh, I wanted to get involved in this company was to scale into it, right? And I also don't think that I would uh, consider investing much more than 5% of my portfolio to this idea, right? So one thing I notice about a lot of retail investors, one of their uh, their biggest uh, flaws, and I got plenty of flaws too, so don't feel bad, is that they scale way, way too big on uh, their investment ideas. You know, they see a stock and they're like, oh, I got a, uh, this is a great company. I love their product. I believe in it. I've done plenty of DD and maybe they've, you know, they they nailed it but they just put way way too much money into any given position we you really got to learn about um diversity and you really got to learn about allocations and sizing there's there's variance you know you, you could be the best investor in all time but if you put all of your your money into one position the chance that you're going to lose in the long run is very 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 high right okay now the next thing i wanted to talk about is my core tenants to my investment thesis in this company. And I think you guys should have them too if you are going to be invested in it or in any company for that matter. Um, Warren Buffett, who I highly respect, mentions three things that he looks for when he's talking about finding good businesses. He looks for companies with a uh, good castle. He talks about companies that have a good moat. And he talks about companies that have good lords. So those are the three things I'm going to be talking about relative to A2. 
Okay, so how I see the castle in this case is the A2 Milk brand itself and their product, which I believe is the most superior product available of its kind. A2 has developed their product themselves and it has properties that make it distinct from other milks. It's, it has niche properties that I really like that uh, differentiates it itself from competitors, right? Now, I think that the demand that you see from the Chinese, it's no surprise to me when you consider its hypoallergenic properties. At the same time, Chinese brands that might be able to, uh, to create a product like this, I don't believe they can meaningfully compete with a foreign product of quality. So to me, when listening to the uh, last conference call, I really like to see the company mentioning maintaining their premium brand quality. It's core to my investment thesis in this company. Now, many people might argue that the Daigao channel is part of the castle and it's fundamental to their business. I've also maintained that the core to my investment thesis is the direct-to-sale China label. Now, I will admit that uh, listening to that recent conference called when I only see a 5% year-over-year growth, it's disappointing and it's concerning. If, if that uh, doesn't continue to grow, then um, I might consider that to be a red flag and consider uh, ditching this company, right? Um, but I like, to men I like to hear that the company is also willing to commit capital to marketing. This is what I've always wanted to see, and it's good to see this transformation taking place. So uh, I'd also like to mention, you know, the, the, the advantage of A2 over some of its competitors too is the fact that they can, they're, uh, they're so capital light, they can uh, commit to an advertising based business. So when I see them returning to uh, investments in advertising, that really makes me uh, happy to see that. Now on the flip side, if we don't see any meaningful and continued growth in China label sales, and uh, you know maybe some other things change, maybe where they become more capital intensive, maybe like their uh, investment in Sinlate Milk, for example, they, uh, they take that to the extreme or they decide to uh, purchase other uh, capital intensive uh, milk producers. That would be kind of alarming to me because that's, that's um, counter to the, uh, the business I see in A2 Milk. Okay, so the, the second thing Buffett looks for in companies are moats. Now, I don't think A2 has the largest moat in the world, um, but it has some. You know, some people say, well, the, the company's got um, uh, patents. Uh, I don't think there's a lot <laughs> that can prevent the, uh, the other competitors from just creating cattle herds that have A2 milk. It, they could get their own, you know, um, uh, DNA test or whatever for their cows, it wouldn't be that hard for them to uh, create an A2 only herd, although it would take some work, right? But uh, A2 has some advantages. It's got first movers advantage and it's got the premium brand strength that it's already developed because it's associated with development of the A2 product, right? Now, I don't think that this moat can not be challenged. It can certainly be challenged. But I think another thing that uh, A2 has an advantage of over their competitors is what I, I think I mentioned a little bit uh, before this, is that they're, they're capital light, right? So because they have so much uh, uh, capital available to them, because they are an advertisement core uh, business at its, at its core, they have the tools to continually redig their moat where I think a lot of their competitors do not, right? So um, again, that's, that's the advantages that I see of this business compared to some of its competitors. Oh, and another thing about the, uh, um, the, the Chinese, right? Because again, the Chinese have been uh, core to this business. The, one of the moats in this company too is that it, the fact that it's a foreign brand, right? Uh, it can, uh, when we're thinking about the product, the quality of Chinese products, when we're thinking about the uh, the Chinese milk scandal that took place a decade ago, these kinds of things have lasting effects on uh, impressions for for customers, right? So this is another slight moat, in my opinion. All right. So the third thing that Buffett looks for is 
the lords of the castle or its management, right? And if you can ask my opinion, with the management, uh, it's mostly been dodgy. <laughs> and under most cases, when uh, researching the, uh, the management, I would have completely been dissuaded from this investment. <laughs> Um, if you didn't want to hold this company because of the management, I certainly wouldn't blame you. And I think that this is probably one of the, the weakest of the three tenants. You know, some of the things that we've seen are some of these guys dumping shares at its peak. <laughs> and then uh, what many are probably now rightly assuming was poor decisions and emphasizing the Daigao channel. Um, you know, when I think most of us would probably assume common sense would say they can't control this channel in any meaningful way. So... Many of us, you know, by the way, we're also anticipating a fourth earnings guidance uh, and it comes as no surprise, right? But, uh, and there's also that, that thing where many companies, there's a motto of, you know, uh, underestimating and over delivering, right? And we have seen probably the opposite uh, from these guys with four continuous downgrades. So if you've lacked confidence in the management, I certainly don't blame you, um, but, uh, I want to say why I have chosen to invest in this company anyway, and with such a weak management core, uh, which would normally be a red flag, the reason I have decided to invest in it anyway is because of their new CEO named David Bertelli. This is one of the things I noticed that a lot of uh, retail they don't research. You know, hedge funds and professional analysts, they pay very close attention to who is in charge of a company. A lot of retail, they, they look at the company, they might look at the earnings, they might look at uh, fundamentals, but they don't think too much about who's running the company or who's uh, in charge of the company until sh shit hits the fan, <laughs> like you've seen recently, right? Um, but I want to mention a few things about the CEO, and I think I mentioned this in, in one of my other videos. Uh, this guy, he has a history of turning around some uh, some companies, and that was what would ultimately decided uh, for me was the that I wanted to get involved in here. It's because the CEO has a history of turning around companies in lousy situations. Uh, so in one case, uh, he he was in charge of a company, a clothing brand. I think it's called uh, Bonds, Brelli, something like that. And, you know, he, he took a lot of flack for cutting jobs, uh, some public sentiment and all of that stuff when they shifted some of their production to uh, offshore. And the company was in some dire straits. They were losing a lot of money. And he decided that in the interest of the company and the interest of turning things around, that he needed to make changes in the company. So he he took some of these uh, high, high, um, highly high-paid labor jobs and, and shipped them overseas. And at the same time, he shifted some of their sales to um, uh, to some of their other other products in their company. So he, I, he, he, he saw the strengths in the company. He took advantage of them, and he noticed the weaknesses in the company, and he removed those. Now, I think that we are starting to see some of that uh, in this company when you look at the recent. Uh, uh, earnings call. We're starting to see a removal of the interest in the Daigao channel as a core tenant to the business. And there's also that thing where we've seen uh, the CEO, I believe, who is in charge of the uh, the Asia Pacific uh, part of the business resigning. I kind of wondered to myself if uh, Borderless Lissy had something to do with that uh, uh, <laughs> that uh, decision for that uh, gentleman to resign. Uh, but that's purely speculation, of course, right? So th because I have confidence in this man, in his properties as a leader, uh, I think this, which would normally be the weakest case in the, the argument for this company, has potential when it otherwise would have none. Now, I also like to see that there's optionality, right? Uh, a lot of people are assuming that, you know, Daigo at this point are are gone. And uh, we're starting to see, you know, prices in the, the shares that are assuming this channel is probably not coming back. Now, like I mentioned, that doesn't mean that prices can't go lower. But I, I think that there's optionality in the fact that uh, if the Daigo channel does come back, let's say Australia decides they're open their borders or that uh, the Australian-Chinese relations tone down their uh, their shenanigans, <laughs> uh, 
that that rep represents, I believe, a tremendous up case, upside case for this company, and I think that's a lot of, something that a lot of people uh, don't consider when they're investing this, right? Now, I, again, I, that doesn't mean I'm counting on that, right? Again, one of the core tenets is, to my thesis is direct to China sales. So this is just optionality to me, right? Now, I won't tell you where this company will go. I can't. I won't. And in the future. <laughs> although I do like to try and predict it, uh, it remains elusive. And I told you why I'm invested in this company and why I'm likely to add more in the long run. And I know the, what things I'm looking for if I decide things aren't um, going the way that I would like in this company. And so I'd like to ask you guys, well, maybe I'll pose the question to you. Why are you invested in A2? And if you are still invested in the company, what would you look for when you are deciding to exit your position?